Welcome to Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and me, Jim Cunningham. Of all the podcasts on all the networks in all the world, Jim Cunningham walks into mine. How are you, sir? I am well. And you, everything okay? That's a Casablanca reference if you're it scoring is. from home. Yes. it's uh, It leads up to one of the most misquoted lines in movie history. But it's not play it again, Sam. It's, it's play it. How's that you're playing? Oh, just a little something on my own. Oh, stop it. You know what I want to hear. No, I don't. You played it for her, you play it for me. Well, I don't think I can remember. If she that. can stand it, I can. Play it. Play it. Play it. Yeah, it's a great scene. It is a great scene. Uh, by the way, this is uh, season four, episode 13 of, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, of the Casablanca got, got podcast. Sorry. podcast. Anyway, today we have just as much of a freewheeling conversation as we just had with a guy named Jonathan Sadowski, very popular in a TV show called Young and Hungry, which I was not aware of, but that was, a, I think that show ran for five years. He was in the show Bleep My Dad Says with uh, William Shatner, the one and only. He's in Live Free and Die Hard with Bruce Willis. You're kidding. Uh, no, I'm not kidding. And it, But in addition to that, um, being an actor in LA and also a producer in LA, he's a magician. And he came up with a, a trick uh, called Predicto, and I saw him demonstrated online somewhere, and I needed something for a bunch of fourth graders, and it was perfect for fourth graders. I'll have a link to how Predicto, uh, what it looks like in the show notes. You can see Jonathan demonstrating it, but it was just the perfect superhero card trick for fourth graders. They just loved it, and it's really clever and really fun. And he's a lot of fun to talk to. Yeah. So, as with most of our interviews, you know, I came to magic relatively late in my life. Jim, you've been doing it since you were a teen, but I'm always sort of interested to find out when real magicians got into magic, what was the, what, what was it that got them into it? And that was the very first thing that I put to Jonathan. First question is, uh, what's your magic origin story? When did it all start? It was a it was a warm warm day in Chicago, and the year was 1988. No, I, I mean it had to be uh, in. I mean, I was probably like nine or ten years old, and uh, I'm from the south side of Chicago, and I remember there was um, there was a magic show, and at one of the churches in like their their big banquet hall, uh, or in the gymnasium. And I'd never been to a magic show before. You know, there's not a lot of uh, big shows in the south side of Chicago, and I go to this show and. Uh, I won the door prize. I won the raffle and it was a magic kit. And um, I remember watching this show and just being blown away. That was the first time I saw things like, uh, you know, the zigzag lady. And I saw, you know, the metamorphosis and, you know, the sub trunk. And I saw all this like zombie ball for the first time. And I was like, it was just like this sensory overload. And uh, I got back home and I was, you know, I couldn't wait to dig into my magic kit. And um, my, there was a church across the street from my house as well. Churches everywhere in the south side of Chicago, <laughs> like every corner. And my mom was in the choir and she came home one day and she said, uh, you'll never guess who the new organist is. And I said, who? And she said, the great Frankini. And that was the guy who did the magic show. And I freaked out and she was like, he wants to meet you. And, uh, and I, went, I went to meet him one day and, and we're to this day, we're, we're best friends. And uh, he kind of, he taught me music, music and magic and, and just what it's like to be an artist and performing on stage. Uh, and that's how I got into it. And ever since then, I, I was, I kind of got the bug, you know, every time I'd go to the school library, I'd check out a book on magic or, you know, every once in a while, when my dad had time, he'd take me to Izzy Rizzy's magic shop on the South side. And yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, as I, as I got older, I, I, you know, kind of, I, I did lose touch with magic a little bit. And, um, I always, you know, I was always the guy in college who would, who would kind of do tricks for people. And uh, I got a few numbers that way as well. <laughs> um, uh, and then um, I remember back in LA, I was like, you know what? I missed this. And then I, I, I was driving down Ventura Boulevard one day and I saw this sign that said the magic apple. And I was like, there's no way that's a magic shop. And sure enough, it was the magic shop. And I went in there and I met Brent and, and uh, dove right back in, man. And, and, you know, 20, two years later, it's more a part of my life than ever. That's fantastic. I should just say as, a, as an aside, when I reached out to Brent to reach out to you, his response was, I'll happily send the email along, but wouldn't you rather interview me? <laughs> 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 and I say, we'll get to you, Brent. We'll get to you. We, we just did a, a, 
a magic shop owner recently. So we got to wait a little bit, but I thought it was, that's, that's a good salesperson right there. I love it. Yeah. The uh, Chicago, great magic town, a lot of great magicians in Chicago. Did you get a chance to uh, have any other, the, the great Frankini? Uh, the great only... Frankini, that was my mentor growing up. And then I went, you know, I would frequent uh, Magic Inc. I'd go to Ash's Magic Shop on the north side. Yeah, so it's uh, it's a great magic town, man. It's it really town. is. It's a it's a tremendous magic town, uh, especially Magic Inc. Did you was Jay Marshall still there at that point? You get a chance I, to yeah, I believe. I mean, I was young. I was young when I went there. Uh, but for the most, I I actually went to Mister Ash's a lot more. I don't know if you guys knew Mister Ash. He passed away recently, uh, but he was like this old school uh, magician. He'd always every time me and Frankie walk in there, he always go, Frank, do you want to buy a magic shop? <laughs> you want to buy a magic shop? <laughs> so other than uh, the great Frankini, other, uh, did you have other mentors? Chicago was just, I mean, you uh, couldn't swing a dead cat without hitting a great magician. No, to be, to be honest, I've lived in Los Angeles longer than I've lived in Chicago now. Oh. Yeah, I moved, I mean, I went to college when I was 17. Uh, and then, you know, once I graduated from college, I was 22 years old and I, I moved right to LA. So... I was, you know, I, I, my, the majority of my magic upbringing has actually been in Los Angeles. Huh. So yeah. about what age did you stop doing it in Chicago? And then how old were you when you picked it up again in Los Angeles? I mean, I did magic for like little parties and stuff like that all through high school. And then um, in college, like I said, I kind of, I kind of stopped. But then when I got back into the, the theater, I, I started performing a little bit again. Um, but I mean, I, I literally bounced once I got, once I got my degree, I, 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 I was like one way ticket to Los Angeles. So I would say like when I was like 23, 24, I, I started getting back into it. And then, uh, but even in college, like I remember, uh, they had Dallas's magic. I was at Andy Dallas. Was he, I, he was like, he, he performed. All, so I went to college at the university of Illinois down in Champaign, Urbana. Oh. And they had they had Dallas's magic shop there. That was the big one. And I think his name was Andy Dallas. I think he passed away now too. But he was like a regular on the Bozo show and and all he was like a big Chicago guy as well. Um, so I would always go in there and pick up little trinkets and stuff and and little packet tricks. Uh, but then in LA, you know, I went, I remember like Frankini and my other buddy John Tresniak, and uh they would they took me to the Magic Castle for the first time when I was like 22, 23. And uh, that's when I really started meeting all these other like local magicians from from Los Angeles. And then uh, I became a mem member of the Academy of Magical Arts when I was, whoa, maybe maybe my early 30s. Um, do you remember your audition that, process? I do remember my audition process. Yeah, uh, I was I was super nervous, which is crazy because I'm an actor and I auditioned like for for a living, I guess. Um but yeah, I walked in there. I did, I did some card stuff. Uh, I think I did like a mentalism effect. And then, uh, and then I remember John George grilled me, man, did he grill me about books I've read. And I remember I'll never, I was like, yeah, you know, stars of magic. He's like, name three tricks from stars of magic. And I was like, Whoa. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, but they, were you able to do it? Yeah, I did. And I got in, I got in. And then one of my, one of my, I met, I think, I think there were like 12 of us that auditioned. I think four or five of us got in and uh, one of my closest friends to this day in, in the magic world, his name is Joe Thomas. He lives in Louisville. Now uh, I remember I was the first person to audition and uh, I came out of my audition and I saw him doing, I saw him just like in like messing around with the other magicians waiting to go in and he did two effects and he did his translocation and he did a rising card, like a, like a, a visual right card rising to the top of the deck with one hand and I was like, there's no way I'm getting in. I was like, there's no, there's no way I'm getting in. <laughs> just like, just smoked me. But then I happened to realize he's legit one of the best people like on the planet in like close up magic. So, uh, but yeah, it was great. It was great. And then in there, it was like, that's when, when, when I, you know, I would visit the castle, like, you know, you're on that high, you got into like this exclusive club and I would go there like four to five times a week. Uh, and that's when like the immersion really started, you know? Yeah. Uh, and just like you're seeing shows nonstop and you're seeing magicians from all over the world and, and you're, you know, taking advantage of the library there. And that's when I really was, I went down the rabbit hole pretty deep. Oh, that's great. What a great place to get out of the rabbit hole. Yeah. That right. Rabbit hole, boy. Yeah. And, uh, what a, what a, what a beautiful, fortunate thing. Uh, that yeah, you, it was wild. 
opportunity. Do you still get to the castle fairly often? I do. I was there a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Not as much as, not as much as I did, you know, as I used to, but yeah, I still, I still pop in occasionally. What benefit was your acting training to being a magician and what benefit was your training as a magician helping you as an actor? Well, I think, uh, first I'll, I'll go the opposite way actually. So okay. my benefit of being a magician and, uh, into being an actor is, is kind of, you know, knowing how to manipulate a room, knowing how to take charge of a room, knowing how to control a room and control interest. Um, so that's especially good when, you know, if I have to do a monologue or something like that, and it's, it's just knowing how to manage a spectator, you know, that's really where magic came in. Um, and my, as far as acting and, uh, going into how does that help magic? My style of magic is, you know, you've seen Predicto, you, uh, I'm very much a storyteller. Um, so I, I love to elicit emotional response. I love like nostalgia and magic. I love like growing up watching the old David Copperfield specials and stuff like that. He always kind of had this story, you know, he, the, one of my favorite ones he talked about, you know, his favorite kind of, he was doing this effect and he said, you know, I do these shows and, and my favorite kind of magic is what happens when the theater's empty. And he went into this beautiful routine with this dancer and, and this, you know, massive illusionary effect. But I was like, wow, I was like, if every effect can start out with that little bit of nostalgia, it makes people automatically almost kind of put their guard down and forget they're watching, you know, a magician. And then it's just more about memory. And, and then you're kind of pulling on heartstrings. And that's the kind of stuff I really love. I love setting this mood and bringing back, bringing people back to a certain time in their life or, or to a certain memory or making them remember something they forgot about. Cause I, I, I just, I love that emotional response and magic. I'm not saying, I'm not saying like, I don't want to have people like weeping when they do it, but I, I just, I think it adds a layer of depth to, to an effect when you can, you know, have an emotional layer. Have you ever had a structured act where you were being paid to go? Like in high school, you said you did tricks. Are, are you that kind of magician or are you a, Hey, Jonathan, do you got anything to show us today? Kind of magician. Uh, it's funny. Like I've had a structured act for a long time and I've, I've only done it in, you know, I'll do it like at the uh, the museum theater at the castle and stuff like that. I've done it a few times, but never in like a paid atmosphere. I was just kind of like workshopping it. And for me, it was like never as a perf I'm like, it was never ready. It was never ready. And people were like, it's it's ready. Just just do it, you know. <laughs> but for the most part, I, I, you know, I do one strolling gig a year. I do this one charity event every year. That's that's my thing. But uh, yeah, magic. I've, I've never been the the show kind of magician. It's just. Yeah. It's it's like you said, it's it's not it's a part of my life, but it's not my whole life, you know. Right. What what are uh what's your go to uh in strolling? What do you what do you got on you? Yeah, you know, one of the, my favorite effects for strolling is uh Richard Sanders ace. Love, 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 knocks it out of the park. There's I mean, it's the kind of the same effect too. There's another one called NFW, it's no effing way. Uh very similar gimmick. I love the coin squeeze, to be quite frank. It's a super old school trick. But again, I talk about how when I was a kid, my grandfather was the handyman in the neighborhood and he always had all these spare parts around. And I and I I would, you know, he'd always make puzzles for me. And one of the puzzles that we made together was this effect. I, and I do the coin squeeze with like, you know, the little like plumber's rings and stuff. Um, I actually do brainwave, um, Max Maven's brainwave. Uh, and it's uh, the way I do it, though, I talk about Christmas. And I say, you know, when I was a kid, uh, all I wanted for Christmas was a blue bicycle. And it was amazing. And I was going to call it the amazing blue bicycle. And I got up one morning and I and I went under the tree and there was a one present there. And and I was disappointed because it did not look like a bicycle. And when I take the, pa the wrapping paper off, it's a box of blue bicycle cards. And I go, but Santa didn't get me one blue bicycle. He got me four amazing blue bicycles. And I go into the routine that way. Uh, but again, it's like, I love that storytelling, add an, adding an emotional layer to it. I like that a lot. I, I yeah. think that, that disarms an audience and we stop thinking about the puzzle and start thinking yeah. about the story in it. Yeah. I think that's smart stuff. And there's a couple, there's a couple of transpositions that I, that I kind of created that, you know, they're not marketed, but I, I do those. And, you know, the first thing I, I say before I perform for anybody, I, I always, I always take a deep breath. I look at them and I say, before we begin, I want to make it very clear. I am not trying to fool you. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody likes being fooled. Nobody made likes being looking like a fool. I go, I'm here to make you experience the things that got me to fall in love with magic, which was that moment when the impossible suddenly became possible. Those little magical moments. That's what we're here trying to find. Um, and that like that really disarms people as well. It's like because then then people are like, oh, oh, I'm looking, you know, I'm not they're not like watching like a hawk. Just like let's experience this together. 
Hopefully I can make you smile. Hopefully I can have you take something back from, from our little time together tonight. That's great. You know, we had Jade on last season. We were talking about doing uh, strolling magic at events and we were talking to her about, you know, how do you, how do you interrupt a group and do that? And how do you psych yourself up? And Jim, I don't know if you remember what she said, but her, her approach was, uh, you know, you're in a big ballroom. There's all these groups of people and they're talking to each other and they're having a good time. She said, I would pretend that I was at a high school reunion and I recognized everybody, didn't remember all their names, but I knew them and they were already friends. And then I would go out and start going from group to group. And she said, it just changed everything because I wasn't interrupting. I was coming and talking to people that I already knew. What is your approach, Jonathan? I, I usually like, if it's like a big gathering, I usually run in the room with a mask on and I say, everybody down. <laughs> um, and then I take the mask off and I, I'm going, I'm kidding. I'm a magician. Um, <laughs> No. <laughs> nice. Oh, wow. I hope anybody listening don't steal that because that's his trademark thing. That's right. You can't. Oh, it's amazing. Um, no, for me, it's like, you know, it, I I don't like doing anything that's that's too uh that's too hokey. I mean, most of the time, like, you know, the event that I do every year, the strolling thing, they know there's a magician there. Uh, and I I just kind of kind of walk up and I say, Hey guys, my name is Jonathan. I am part of the entertainment tonight. How are we doing? Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to, to, you know, show you a few things. And, and, and that's, that's literally it. It's super simple. It's a weird analogy, but my, my, my producing partner and my, my manager, he always says, you know, an audition is, uh, it's like a first date and your goal shouldn't be anything but to get a second date. So, and I kind of view magic the same way. It's like, I walk up and I'm going to show you something. And this is going to be like this, that's like your first date. And uh, if you like it, I'll, I'll show you something else and it'll be our second date, you know? And it's kind of like, it's, I think strolling magic is knowing how to read a room. Sometimes people don't want to be interrupted. Uh, you know, when you have the audience on the hook, you know, when they're done and it's just knowing uh, it's like Kenny Rogers, you know, you got to know when to fold them, you know, yeah. and you can be, you can be the greatest magician in the world. And sometimes people just aren't into it. You know, mm -hmm. they're just, they, they want to drink their whiskey and, and shoot the yeah. with their friends. So yeah. it's, you know, you walk up there, you you do your thing and know when to walk away. That in itself is an art form. Yeah, it's true. I mean, you, yeah. you come by that knowledge only by doing it and doing it and doing it, can you sense. Yeah. And there are plenty of uh, magicians that have come up to me in situations like that who have not acquired that skill yet. Yeah. When, when it's time to go. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's a lot about knowing the scope of the event you're performing in. You know, I've, I've competed at, in like the strolling showdown at the magic castle a few times and uh, like everyone there knows what they're there for. Right. Like the charity event I do every year, everybody knows there's two magicians walking around, but sometimes you go, you know, there's parties and you don't know, you don't know there's a, like somebody hired a magician and they come up and they make the magician will make it about them. And they're like, I'm the entertainment. And it's like, you are this, this isn't the party about you. You're here to enhance the party, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, and it's just, it's, I think, who said this recently? I forget who said, I think it was Brian Cranston, but he said, everybody has a role, you know? And you have to know your role. Whether you're, when on a movie set, if you're a background actor, or if you're the lead, or if you have two lines in one scene, know your role. Everybody has a job, yep. you know? And and no, no job is necessarily more important than the other. But it's just knowing your role, doing your job to the best of your ability in that moment, you know, and that's that. I think that's a lot about performing. You know, you never want to be it's it's like <laughs> one of my one of my buddies is a stand up comic and he talks about can you imagine if like he talks about strip clubs and it's like, you know, people walk up like this the dancers walk up to like, hey you want to dance and it's like you know at the magic castle it's like the same thing it's like a strip club of magicians people like walk up to you they're like hey want to see a trick you know <laughs> it's like know your role you know know your role know when people are interested know when they're not <laughs> yes and your role changes from room to room and uh, absolutely the smart person absolutely. recognizes when they're the lead and when they just need to step back and let the lead yeah there's a big difference between you being a strolling magician who's hired to do an event or you being, you know, performing and the close-up gallery where people are coming to see you, you know? It's a very big difference in in, in entertainment there. Agreed. So is Predicto the first released marketed trick you've done? It is. It is. 
I've had many other effects that, like I said, that I've created, but this one, uh, yeah, this one is, it, it really uh, has a special place in my heart. I don't know. I, I just, I, I, I kind of talked to Brent about it and um, I pitched it and he's like, we're, he's like, we're for sure marketing this. And I was like, you think so? And he's like, absolutely. We're marketing this. Yeah, it did really well. And we, you know, we did the, uh, the horror version because I loved mm -hmm. horror movies. I don't know if you saw that. And we have a few other, we have a few other editions we're thinking about. We're thinking about releasing as well. Are you a superhero fan or is that just part of the story? I am. I mean, uh, no, grow, like growing up, Spider-Man and 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 uh, Bat or Superman were like, I flipped out with super, Superman movies. Fli absolutely flipped out. Yeah. So where did Predicto come from? How did you how did you create that? Well, I was at the Magic Apple and um, I saw someone performing this or this uh, this guy was in there and he was purchasing this effect that he swore by and it was called misprediction um, where basically you have four spectators select cards four in four separate cards and one by one you find them and then the fourth card it's the final spectator and it's a miss you don't get it and you have these four cards sitting on the table but when you turn them all over the backs of the cards are the are the card that was the fourth spectator's card nice. and i said i said i like this uh, I like it a lot. I go, but for me, the minute you you use cards that that lets the spectator go, these are gimmicked. Like these, like if you can turn all these cards over, that means they're not a real deck to begin with, mm -hmm. you know. And th there was kind of a misconnect there if people thought about mm -hmm. it. And I thought about, you know, it's super. I was like, what do people love, and what what's an easier way to do this? And I said, well, if you just had like this idea of a kid that that loves superheroes, and he, he his his alter ego was this guy Predicto, and he can always predict the future. Well, now you're in that world, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like, and it's a kid would do it. So he wouldn't use playing cards. It was like he would he would use his crayons and he would make his own little cards for this thing. And that's kind of where the whole impetus for the the effect came from. And it was as simple as that. And like I said, the whole story revolved around that one hook. Was I I came up in a. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes these lines just come to me, but and in the prediction envelope, I said in this envelope, there's one prediction and one prediction only. And if you give Predicto enough chances, Predicto will never be wrong. And there, it's kind of a funny point of words because it's, it's four predictions, but at the end, it is only one prediction. You know, that's right. It's a charming, true. charming trick. And uh, can you just talk about the process a little bit? From okay, I got an idea, and now how am I going to turn this into something that could be marketed? Absolutely. So I'm, I have my, my degree is in playwriting. Uh, I have a BFA in theater. My, my focus was in playwriting and directing. So I, like I said, I love a good story. But when it came to the actual production of the effect, I totally followed Brent's lead. Um, he has released so many effects. And this was a, brand, like, a whole new world to me. So Brent was like, I need you. He's like, you get this thing to where you think it's ready to go. And we can, I will get it made. So I literally came home, I wrote this entire story about my nephew and about how he loves superheroes and now or how I grew up loving superheroes. And now I got my nephew who loves superheroes and uh, how we created this character Predicto together. And I was like, now, how do I make this fully realized? And I was like, uh, again, I didn't want to use playing cards. And I was like, oh my gosh, this would be great. I was like, I just saw these question marks, question, like almost like the Riddler. So I started playing with design options with these question marks. And I was like, let's take another, let's make it more real. And I was like, it wouldn't be just like a typewriter bold face or font on these cards. I go, he would draw them. He would have crayons or markers and he would draw them. So I started looking in all these fonts and I designed this font that kind of looked like a child's, you know, handwriting and or a child, the way a child would write. And it's funny because like letters are backwards and, and I mixed up capital letters with lowercase letters and kind of created this. It looks like a kid drew these, you know? And now the trick was really starting to be realized. And then we, uh, this is, this is pretty funny, uh, but I'm going to give you a big secret of Predicto here. We used AI to generate the the prediction photos. Uh, and I literally, I oh. went into, I went into an AI program and I said, uh, draw a children's crayon drawing of Wonder Woman and then, or generate a child, a child's crayon drawing of Spider-Man. And we kept on modifying these and modifying these, but they're an AI generated uh, stuff on the back so it looks like a kid drew them and that's how we that's how we had the production stuff yeah that's great yeah and it was cr crazy because you'd be surprised how many how many versions we scrapped it was like we like this one we like this in this photo and we like this in this photo we had to try and merge them together that was legit one of the hardest things like trying to find the right damn photo that we we're gonna because it's ultimately has to be the kicker ending it's like it has to mm -hmm. you know so actually getting that down perfect that that took us you know a couple of weeks to, to to really iron that out. 
Uh, well, it's a great it's a great effect. I really enjoyed uh, watching you perform it. What's the what's kind of been the reaction to it uh, when you do it, or uh, you know, straight across the board now that it's a marketed effect? I am completely blown away by the response. We sold out pretty quick of the one we so we 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 had a limited run. We made we didn't package all of them. We sold out of the ones we packaged. We repackaged the next. Murphy's bought a ton. They sold out. They ordered more, and it's it's just been overwhelming. It's you know it, it like I don't necessarily think you like these effects have to be like knuckle busting effects, and you have to learn all these slides. I think sometimes the simplest stuff with a good story, you know, like self working card tricks are are legit miracles. Sometimes you know. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So part of the whole process, Brent and I again we had five different methods that we're going to use, and we're like, what's the simplest one that a kid can do? You know, it's like no slights. No elastic, no rough, smooth, just like out of the box, ready to perform. As a non-magician, I can tell you the instructions were great. I'm going with the much simpler force that you do at the end rather than yep. I'm, I'm not going to try mixing cards while I'm talking. In front of yeah. people. The only variation that I've made on it at the end, I don't, you, you lay them out so you can just flip it over and it's there. Yeah. And for me, that felt too perfect. Like, Oh, yeah. So I just flip it over so that now there's four weird things. You go, what is that? And then you just move them into place and it's Spider-Man, which I, for me worked better because it's like, oh, yeah, it seems more accidental. I love it. Brent, that's how Brent does it. So I, I am insanely OCD, like, like insanely. Like if there's like a crooked, like you can see my photos on the wall. They're like, yeah. if, if like, so for me, I just, I did that. And, and I think also I, the way I, I demonstrated that in the, in the instructional, I think it's the easiest way to make sure they line up because I don't, yeah. I, I, if, if I'll tell you a funny story to me, that made the most sense on how to explain it. Right. Instead of saying, oh, then turn them over and then fish it to try to figure out how to put them together. There was a gentleman, <laughs> and this is why I love Brent. There was a gentleman who purchased Predicto, came back and returned it because he said it was too difficult <laughs> mm. and, and said, <laughs> Quit magic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it lays it so people love it. People and I am all for like make it your own, man. I present an idea. I think, you know, any effect that you learn, you know, it, it make it your own, personalize it, change the pattern, you know, however, however it's gonna make your performance of the effect go for it, have at it, man. Any other reactions you're getting from buyers besides it's too difficult? <laughs> No, there were a couple of people that were like, you know, oh, you stole this from me or I had this. I forget who it was, but there was like there was someone that tried to say, like, I owed him credit because he had this thing published in like the 1980s in some obscure magazine. And I was like, I was like, dude, I was like, I don't I don't know your effect. I don't know. And it was it wasn't even cl remotely close to the same idea. Uh, but I think all these people are like trying to grasp. It's like when when people create an effect. They're like, oh, you need to, you need to give me, this is my idea, which, and which I did. I mean, the effect that inspired me to do it, I gave credit for right there, that misprediction effect. I have no, no problem saying it. You know, I didn't just come up with this out of the blue, something triggered this in me, but the, the, the response has been overwhelming. I, I do it uh, actually at, at conventions around town. I've done it. Uh, I went with Brent to a few, the horror one. So I, you know, I was an actor, I've, I've been in horror movies and I do appearances at horror conventions. So I started doing it at horror conventions and selling them at horror conventions and stuff. And people love it. Yeah. Any any tips for anybody that might be listening, thinking, I, I, I have something that I, I have always wanted to market. Uh, any tips that you would give them? Do it. That's my tip. Ready? My buddy Ross, my best friend in the world, is a, is a huge songwriter, massive songwriter. And he has uh, this studio... And in his studio, he has this big neon sign that says, geniuses finish things. And everybody can have an idea. Finish it. Do it. I don't care if you have to make it by hand. Find a way to get it done. Finish it and get it out there. And you know what? It might suck, but you finished it. And you got it out there. And I guarantee you, you've learned something from that. And your next one's going to be better. But do it. Get it out there. I, as a producer, my producing, I, I did this film, uh, 8-Bit Christmas mm -hmm. for New Line Cinema a couple of years ago. And it was like my baby. You know, I'd, I'd worked on this thing for like five years. Me and my partner had got the rights. I found this book. We got the rights. We made it. We turned it into this massive movie. And I was, during the whole development process, I was super precious about the entire movie. I was like, this can't happen. This has to happen. This has to happen. And my buddy, 
uh, he said, Sadowski, you, 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 you can't be precious. He's like, number one rule, get the movie made. He goes, otherwise you're, otherwise you're just a producer who's never produced anything, yeah. mm. you know? And it's true. It's, you know, get it done. That's, that's my best advice. If you have an idea, figure out a way to do it and do it. That is the best advice. Amen. Um, yeah. We're going to cross the streams here. And Jonathan, I'm just going to warn you. Last year, we had Nicholas Meyer on, uh, who did Star Trek Wrath of Khan, and he did Time After Time, and he'd written a bunch of Sherlock Holmes books. And he came on saying, oh, come on, but I just want to talk about Sherlock Holmes. I'd rather not go into the other things, because I talk about the other things all the time. And it was a great episode, two, two-part episode. Nicholas Meyer is a great storyteller. His Sherlock Holmes stuff is amazing. But at one point, he made a reference to Wrath of Khan. And Mr. Cunningham, my friend here, said, sir, you've opened the door. I'm coming in uh, because Jim is a, a, a huge William Shatner fan. And oh, nice. so we just have to ask about. About my boy, my boy, Bill. He's on the wall right there behind there me. There he is. Oh, wow. <laughs> on this show, we'll call it uh, Bleep My Dad Says. Bleep My Dad Says. Yes, I've heard of it. Yes. Yeah, How did that happen for you? What? So that 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 entire process was uh <laughs> so I auditioned for that role and they wound up casting some I'm trying to remember exactly how it happened now. I know they wound up casting someone else who was a friend of mine. His name was Ryan Devlin. They cast Ryan. And then I was going to do this other show called Wilfred. I was like, or I was I screen tested for this show called Friends with Benefits. I didn't get that. And then I, they wanted me to do the show Wilfred that Elijah Wood wound up doing. Mm -hmm. And as I was screen testing for Wilfred, they had they decided they were going to recast the main character in Bleep My Dad Says. So they brought me back in to Bleep My Dad Says. I said no to Wilfred. I screen tested for Bleep My Dad Says and I got hired. And it was, I wish I could say it was the greatest experience of my life. It was not. William Shatner is absolutely lovely the cast was absolutely lovely but there were some personalities who on that set who i dream about running into again with a car had that not been my first show there would have been there would have been some fireworks on that set i was yeah uh it was it was one of the worst experiences of my acting career uh. and I, i'm i'm okay to say that now well i'm sorry to have brought it up no it's fine i'm happy to talk about it and uh yeah there there was uh like I said, nothing but nothing but praise for the for the cast and crew. Uh, but there were there were some people there that uh, the Jonathan Sadowski today that they, they would have they would have gotten it they would have gotten it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, then uh, I don't want to dwell too deeply here. No, it's fine. Uh, but but give me give me one Shatner story that you like. I will tell you one of my. <laughs> I don't think I've ever told this story before. Wow, oh, fabulous. So, so we, it was like our first week of rehearsals. Now, mind you, they shot this entire pilot already. And we had, now we have to reshoot all of my stuff and reshoot the whole thing again in front of a whole new live audience. And there was this joke that Bill didn't quite understand. And him and the writers, were, the writers were very, what's the word I would try to say? They were very sweet with Bill. And they were like, you know, it's this, this, and this. And he was like, I, I just don't, I don't, uh, I don't get, I don't, I'm not, you know. And I said, Bill, it's, it's like this. And he goes, Jonathan, not now. And he uh -huh. like, all right, there. Yeah. I've known you three days, right? Yes. And uh, I kind of walked away and I let them do their thing. And uh, I remember I was eating lunch and Bill uh, walked up to me and he, I feel a pat on my shoulder. And I look up and it's William Shatner. And he kind of leans down and he puts his face right next to mine. And he says, sorry about that, but you didn't have a dog in that fight. No. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And uh, ever like him and I, we had breakfast together every morning. I went to his house for the Super Bowl. We were thick as thieves. He was wonderful and a total pro, like total pro. Well, I'm a big, big, huge honking fan and have been uh, since the early days of Star Trek. For me, I didn't see it till it was in syndication, <laughs> but I'm, uh, in fact, uh, I work for our local uh, NHL franchise here, and uh, Mr. Shatner was in town for uh, one of the conventions, and they sent me with a jersey, uh, our wild jersey, yeah. with his name on the back, and I was to try to get to him 
and ask him to say, you know, hey, uh, we were going into the playoffs. Can we, you know, would you would you just say, hey, uh, Minnesota Wild, go get him? And uh, so I was the producer of the con- the thing took me there, and then he said, you wait here, I'm gonna go talk to him. And so he went. They were maybe. 50 feet from me and I saw them talking and Bill kind of Mr. Shatner kind of looked over at me and I held up the jersey and I saw him turn back to the other guy and kind of shake his head like that and then he walked away and the producer came back and said he'd love to help you out uh and he appreciates the jersey and I said he can have it one way or the other he said he doesn't want it he's a big Montreal Canadiens fan and yeah. He's afraid if he supports the Minnesota Wild, he's going to get some blowback in Montreal because of it. And so I totally respect that. But uh, oh, you still have a jersey that says Shatner on the back? In my closet. <laughs> <laughs> and I occasionally put it on. Oh, my God. Is that hilarious? Yeah. And, uh, but it, that's as close as I've ever got to uh, to getting a chance to meet him. Um, oh, and someday, wonderful. someday yeah, I will. Great. No. I, I actually ran into him recently, or not recently. This just has to be a couple, of, two, three years ago now. We were at this restaurant in uh, in L.A. And my buddy, I was there. We were there with a friend of my buddy. He's like, Shatner's over there. I was like, oh, no way. So I get up and I walk over to him. He's getting up there. He's like 90, you know. And uh, and I, I kind of kneeled down at his table and said, Bill. And he looks at me and he's like, and he kind of like, he was like taking it back. And I said, it's Jonathan from my dad says. And he goes, You've aged. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. You know, I really thought when you knelt down at the table and said, hi, Bill, he was going to say, Jonathan, not now. <laughs> <laughs> that I thought that's where we were going. <laughs> that would have been great. All right, let's wrap up here with one final magic question. Sure. What excites you about magic today? It's a really good question. I think what excites me about magic today is what excites me about all forms of art and how, you know, when you watched a movie, like when we watched Superman, the original Superman, you thought that was the pinnacle of technology. And now here we are with movies like Avatar. And I remember when I first saw like the zigzag, like the zigzag lady, I was like, that's the pinnacle of magic. And for an art form that focuses on making the impossible possible, I look forward to seeing what is possible in the future with magic. Um, I think the artistry and the the tech, the, these these sleight of hand technicians that are out there, they're doing stuff that we never would have dreamed of, you know, 20 years ago. And, you know, now with technology and, and all this stuff, like, you know, you have these companies out there working with technology and magic. They're literally, there's miracles that are being created. And uh, I look forward to unpacking some of those miracles in the future because, that that's that's the like I said at the beginning. You know, I uh, I I what I love about magic is falling in love with those moments where the impossible becomes possible. And uh, I just I I I am excited to see what these creators are going to show you is possible to do. Making the impossible possible and falling in love with that. I love his attitude about magic, his excitement about what's coming in the future. And I love everything about Shatner. So uh, it, it was a really great interview for many reasons. That, not the least of them, for me. You know, this is just another example of someone who we've talked to who had magic as a background and kind of can fall back on it when he needs to. But he certainly has benefited in magic from his background in acting, where he knows how to control a room. You know, he knows how to do an audition. If you can imagine being at the Magic Castle Jeez. and auditioning for that. No, I can't. I, I wouldn't even consider it. So uh, kudos to him. And and also, I, I, there are many things about this interview I like, but I always like it when somebody is humble enough to say, I came out of the room, looked at the next guy and went, oh, crap. I, I'm never going to get it. I love that. I, that uh, that says volumes about a human being to me, that uh, you can realize where you are on the uh, magic spectrum or any spectrum for that matter. Yeah. And, you know, Shatner. You got yeah, a couple Shatner, Shatner stories. I, I can't get enough of the Shatner stories. I, uh, I, I know how old he is. And I know that uh, as 
I think all of the great English actors have said, I realize there's less in front of me than there is in the rearview mirror. I've got to find a way. I've got to find a time that I can actually meet the man and tell him what a huge influence he had on me as a young actor. Well, Jim, it just took a lot of planning, but turn around. Is Howie. he beaming into my kitchen? He's not. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please, Jim. if there's anyone I know who could sort of make that happen for me, yeah, you would be right at the top of the damn list. So I don't ask for much. I, I don't. I really don't. I know you don't. <laughs> anyway, um, if you get a chance, pick up Predicto or at least look at the link uh, in the show notes. It's, you it's know, a I'm delight. A, it's a delight. I'm a non-magician. I, I did the simpler version of it. There's a, there's a slightly more complicated uh, way of forcing a card and I did the, the easiest way of doing it but the kids loved it it was a big hit and it's a card trick that doesn't involve playing cards it's a yeah. card trick that involves superheroes so it uh, I loved it in their wheelhouse I'm a big superhero fan through my son I wasn't as a kid but I am now well you should get it I should get it I should get everything that's the problem that's that There's, is uh, you know the amount of magic i own versus the amount of magic i do would lead one to believe that i'm an idiot because uh, <laughs> i have a lot of magic uh and i do very little so i uh i, I if if the occasion presents itself and there is uh i'm at a convention let's say i don't know somewhere in the midwest and there is a copy of it for sale i will absolutely buy it all right you hear that dealers reach out to jim cunningham yeah because he's an easy, easy mark. Anyway, oh, thank boy, you uh, again to uh, Jonathan for talking with us. Uh, I love chatting with him. And speaking of things we love, we're going to mm -hmm. do, because we're smart, we're remembering to do this. Yeah. We're going to do the I love that segment. So do you have an I love that this time? I do. Around? Yeah, I, I do have an I love that. I assume people could get this. I mean, it's widely serious is a, a, a thing that people can tap into if they want serious radio. Serious and, radio, uh, yeah. I really have been enjoying um, a podcast called Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend. Well, I'm going to I'm going to stop you right there and tell you that uh, you can get that anywhere you get podcasts. Oh, is that right? Yeah, it does. Not just on Sirius. Any mm -hmm. podcast writer have it because I don't really have Sirius, uh, but I've listened to Conan O'Brien Needs a Friend, and I will be honest, I only listen to the interview episodes, not the ones where he talks to um, fans. But he has some great interview folks on there. Absolutely, he does. And, and he's, you know what? He's a good interviewer. Yeah, he is. Over and above uh, being Conan O'Brien and funny and quirky and all of the things that uh, we've come to know and expect from him, he can really ask good questions and he's willing to listen, which not every interviewer is. So I'm, uh, I enjoy that immensely. Uh, I just wrapped up the Carol Burnett episode. Uh, they went to her for that one, which is yeah. rare for them. Why wouldn't you? If Carol yeah. Burnett said we'd go to Carol Burnett, if she was to find out if Carol Burnett has a magic background, it's it, it's really quite charming, I think. Yeah, and you can cherry pick through the uh, the interviewees you you want. Right. Well, that's an excellent one. That's an excellent one. I believe that my I love that my guy might have been on Conan O'Brien needs a friend at some point. He certainly has been on a lot of the different podcasts promoting himself. There's a comedian named Gary Goldman. Oh, I yeah. have a link to oh, my his, God. probably his most famous routine. He went on Conan and did this, I think, six or eight minute routine about the uh, documentary film about the people who abbreviated the state's names. And it's about the funniest routine I've ever, it is so honed and so perfect and he delivers it so well. And that's kind of was sort of my entry point to Gary Goldman. I and think it was everybody's thing. entry point to Gary Goldman, even though, you know, you, you, you see him and you realize well, you didn't start with that. So no, he's been around he's for been years, around for 30 years or whatever. Years. I'm just getting to it now. But yeah, it's brilliant and so sharp and witty and absolutely smart from the get go uh, okay. that you can't help but love him. Thanks very much. I just wanted to uh, recommend a documentary to everyone and then and then I'm going to go. Um, it's about the, uh, it's about the men and one woman who abbreviated all 50 states down to two letters. All you, all you have to know for this is that we have 50 states in America and they each have a two capital letter abbreviation. But that, that wasn't always the case. Up until, I want to say 1973. And so I will. Uh, 
up until 1973, every state had its own length of abbreviation, and it was chaos. Like Massachusetts was M-A-S-S period, Florida was F-L-A, Utah was Utah. <laughs> they just dropped the H, not much of an abbreviation. But then the post office said, no, every state has to have a two capital letter abbreviation, and so they convened a crack squad of abbreviators. They assembled a ragtag outfit of rogues, misfits, and ne'er-do-wells. <laughs> How often do well? Ne'er. They ne'er. <laughs> They ne'er did well. And they were charged with abbreviating all 50 states down to two letters. Now, I read this description to the documentary, and much like you, thought to myself, how are they going to make a 98-minute documentary about a task that couldn't have taken more than six minutes to complete? <laughs> boy, boy, was I wrong. It was an adventure. Ups and downs, ins and outs, friends became enemies, enemies became friends. They, they started off, they thought it was going to be easy, because Alabama lulled them into a false sense of security. They said, Alabama, A-L. Holy crap, this is easy. <laughs> That's just a sample of it. I have a link in the show notes to the full routine. I also have a link to, he has several great stand-up specials, but he has one which is sort of half stand-up special, half documentary called The Great Depression, which oh. is about uh, when he was having his most serious bout with depression and went home at age 40-something, maybe? Late 30s, early 40s, and returned to his childhood bedroom to oh. work his way through it, uh, which he mentions, he sort of semi-chronicles it in his book, Misfit, which I'll also have a link to, which uh, Misfit is mostly about his school years from kindergarten, I think, into college. But he intersperses that with, he was writing it while he was having uh, this major depression. Mm. Uh, and it's not like a downer, it's not. He's very, very, very funny and very insightful. So anyway, that's uh, Gary Goldman is the, I love it that I have this time, and you can listen to uh, the abbreviation of states' names in the show notes or go and see one of his stand-up specials or read his book uh, at the library if you want. I bet there's a great audiobook of it as well. And if he comes to your town uh, and you're looking for stand-up comedy, you know, I would go. say he's in the top five working today I agree. when it comes to originality and skill as a stand-up comic. And uh just in case people think that we have somehow uh, talked beforehand on what our particular uh, I love this is going to be, because both of them, we got to Gary Gulman, I think, through Conan O'Brien and my mm -hmm. whole deal was Conan O'Brien. We did not talk about this. We just happen to be on the same damn wavelength most of the time. Yeah. And then when we aren't, it's really funny because we it's like we're speaking to two different Two people are speaking in two different languages. Exactly. It's exactly. very puzzling. It's very puzzling. All right. So those are the, I love it. There's uh, links in the show notes. We got to get down to business here. This is, we, we really had a long do. interview and then we did Casablanca and now we're doing this. So let's just jump in. Last time, I think you read chapter, chapter 12. 12. 12. Yeah, okay. So well, this is episode 413. So this would be up, uh, this this would be chapter 13. Let me recap quickly what happened. Would you? I, I'd appreciate 12. that. This is a recap of chapter 12. Yep. Okay. Uh, Eli uh, left the comic book store. He got a call from Tracy, picked her up from the hospital. This is where we discussed the idea of don't go to slippery places. Eli asked Harry a difficult question. Do you like my act? And then he spent the evening practicing his act because he just doesn't practice enough. He has gotten a little lazy and he admits that. Uh, that was the end of chapter 12, taking us right now into chapter 13. <laughs> Chapter 13 Mr. Marks, welcome to Bimax. Have you been offered a beverage? Sherry Lisbon asked the question in such a manner that it came out more like a potential accusation against her assistant than a warm, hospitable offer directed toward me. I'll say this for her. She knew how to establish an immediate tone for a meeting. As a corporate magician... I've met my share of CEOs, and you can set your comic bungling stereotypes aside. The ones I've met have been dynamic, magnetic, and surprisingly sharp. Their focus may be on the bottom line, but most have known how to carry a conversation and how to win over a room. Some have even been remarkably warm and funny. This last was not the case with Sherry Lisbon, the CEO of Bimax. The snowy and icy view through her large office windows was warmer than the hand which shook mine. Her steel-blue eyes were colder than the skating rink visible through the window on what must have been 
a corporate-built man-made pond. Her well-coiffed hair was so blonde it might have been white, but that could have been a trick of the light. She wore a tailored skirt and coat combination, which was accessorized with a variety of bracelets and rings emblazoned with stones of various colors. Around her neck was a simple gold necklace, which she touched unconsciously after shaking my hand, perhaps reassuring herself I hadn't lifted it in some well-practiced pickpocket move. Of the four possible suspects I had met, Sherry Lisbon was the biggest puzzle, and that was clearly by design. Clifford Thomas was a flat-out local celebrity, and Randall Glendower was an Internet sensation. So research on those two, if I had needed it, which I hadn't, would be deep and plentiful. Chip Kavanaugh's presence on the Internet was less pervasive. The Kavanaugh Bank empire was publicly owned, albeit a huge percentage of the company was still owned by the family. And so finding out about him had been a relative ease. In fact, I'd been able to accomplish it with my phone while parked in a visitor spot outside his downtown condo. Sherry Lisbon was something else altogether. Bimax was a privately held company, and a little digging on my part demonstrated just how private it was. The company website was designed to sell products of all shapes and sizes and make that process easy. It also seemed designed to tell you as little about the company and its owner as possible. Mission accomplished, I had decided that morning, after spending two fruitless hours trying to get a sense of my next and final interview subject. The police warned me of your visit, she said with a smile but no humor, gesturing to a seat in front of her desk as she returned to the rich leather chair behind it. There was nothing on the desk's surface, not even a piece of paper, a pen, or a phone. Given how barren it was, I wondered for a moment why it needed to be so large. I lowered myself into one of the two chairs facing the desk. Yes, thank you for seeing me on such short notice, I began, settling into the chair uncomfortably. They gave me the impression the visit was mandatory. However, I can't imagine how such a request could be effectively enforced. Her words were clipped, and she sounded angry, but her face revealed no emotion. In her late forties, she had high, strong cheekbones and a long, thin neck. If surgery had been involved to create her look, it was an impressive and invisible job. It can't be, I said with my most sincere smile, which is why I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me. Mr. Marks, I can tell you what I told them, she said, getting right down to it. I certainly knew Tyler James and had done some business with him in the past. Their arrival to question me was the first I had heard of his death. That must have come as quite a shock, I suggested. She stared at me as if I had just begun speaking a foreign language, so I blabbered on. I mean, finding out about his death that way. We weren't close in any sense of the word, she said, throwing a glance at her assistant, which spoke volumes. The young lady hightailed it out of the room so quickly that had this been a cartoon, she would have stirred up a small dust cloud in her wake. I reacted as I would to the loss of any vendor. And how is that? She looked at me with the closest thing to an emotion she had revealed thus far, if slight puzzlement qualifies as an emotion. How is what? Well, how do you typically react to the loss of a vendor? You get a new vendor, she said. It wasn't as if I was being scolded, but it felt darn close. Having not been scolded in, I don't know, 25 years, it took me a moment to recognize the feeling. I didn't like it any more now than I had when I was a kid. She continued to stare at me. Somewhere, I heard a clock ticking, even though none was visible in the room. What sort of business did you conduct with Mr. James, I ventured, buying or selling? Exclusively buying, she said as she spotted a piece of invisible dust on the desk and removed it with great care and unnecessary precision, being it was invisible and all. What sorts of things did you buy? I continued, feeling like I was coming toward the end of a painful and rather futile game of twenty questions. I honestly don't remember, she said. 
I buy lots of things. That is, in fact, my business. She made the slightest nod to TV monitors on the far wall, which silently projected the live images from studios around the country or around the world. There were a lot of monitors, and on each one of them, in a different Bimax studio, a plethora of products were being presented for sale. All the screens were silent, but the scrolling text on each screen represented a diverse variety of languages, many of which I recognized, but none of which I could read. I turned back to her. I thought you were in the business of selling. She shook her head, oh, so slightly, and I thought I recognized the slimmest trace of a smile cross her lips. I'm in the business of selling in order to provide me with the resources to be in the business of buying. Sometimes I sell the things I buy, often at a significant profit. Sometimes I simply keep what I have purchased. The change in subject seemed to suddenly energize her. Tell me, Mr. Marks, do you shop? I'm sorry? Do you, from time to time, visit a department store, or perhaps our own Mall of America, and move from store to store with no other intention than to discover something to buy? Or peruse the Internet with no other goal than to find a treasure you never knew existed but now must own at all costs? I was about to attempt to form an answer, but she cut me off. No. You don't strike me as the type. She gave me another long look, which felt sort of piercing. No, not the type at all. What type do you think I am? I asked, trying to sound confident in the boldness of my question. I doubt it fooled her for a second. You, like so many people, mostly men, but not confined to one gender, are targeted buyers. You need something, you find it, you buy it, and then you're on to something else. But that's not how you do it? No, that's not my approach. For me, there is nothing more fulfilling than finding an object, a rarity, a one-of-a-kind item, and swooping in and plucking it away. She hit the word plucking with such force, I felt myself jump just a little. Does it matter what it is? She shrugged. Sometimes. Not always. For you, it's the swooping and the plucking. This produced, for the first time, an actual smile. I suppose you could put it that way. Is that what you did with Tyler James? Swooped and plucked? Saying it out loud made it sound vaguely dirty, but if she was offended, she kept it to herself. She turned toward me. It felt like she was either starting to warm up to the subject or to me. I desperately hoped it was the subject. Tyler and I used to play a little game, she said. She stared me down, like she was teasing me to ask more. A game? I worked hard and succeeded in keeping my voice from cracking. What kind of game? Sometimes he would find himself in a situation with two bidders, each going after the same object, tooth and nail, each one outbidding the other, an escalating battle, as it were. If Tyler was feeling like a bad boy, and he was often a bad boy, don't think for a second he wasn't, he might get in touch and allow me to enter the fray. To swoop, I suggested. Yes, to swoop in at the last second and outbid them all. And pluck. Yes. Again, almost a smile, but not quite. Swoop and pluck. She basked in the recollection for a long moment. Why? I asked, breaking the silence. Was it something you wanted? Was what something I wanted? The thing you outbid them on. I have no idea. In fact, I often had no idea what I was bidding on. Now it was my turn to feel like someone was speaking a foreign language. Then why do it? I really can't explain, she said her voice dropping to just above a whisper. But, Mr. Marks, let me share this with you. There are few pleasures on this earth equal to stepping in at the last second and taking something someone else desires. I mean, 
something they really, really want. An object, a relationship, a person. She turned and looked at me. Her eyes were cold, yet they somehow burned into me. You should try it sometime. You might be surprised just how pleasurable that can be. Mercifully, our interview concluded moments later, and I was quickly and efficiently escorted back out the way I had arrived through a maze of cubes and TV monitors and white noise. Dusk had come, and the thermometer in my car put the temperature at a frigid 14 degrees, but it felt balmy compared to the Arctic chill I'd felt in Sherry Lisbon's office. I had turned back as I exited, and I caught her eye. The look she gave me was decidedly predatory, but, and I might have been imagining this, and I hope I was, there was a sexual component which was both undeniable and frightening. I tried to convince myself I was imagining it, and I think I almost succeeded. Once the car started, I immediately switched on the seat warmer and cranked the heater up to full. However, I didn't start to feel any real warmth until I was nearly home. I feel so sorry for Eli having to have gone through that encounter with Sherry Lisbon. She is a amalgamation of several executives I dealt with in my uh, years doing meetings and events. Jim and I met doing meetings and events and videos. I've often said that the the, the meeting business is the executive ego business. <laughs> uh, and everybody has an ego. Everybody does. But give someone a title, a little bit of power. And they go insane. And they can just be horrible. And um, Sherry Lisbon is an example I remember, you know Tom Lieberman, right? I do know Tom Lieberman. He's a a local producer and musician and a super talented guy. We ran in the same circles doing meetings and events. And I remember chatting with him once saying, you know, it's interesting. You you spend a lot of time, and at least I did and he did, in executive suites talking to executives because that's who we dealt with. And for the most part, you know, they're pretty good there you know you see these examples on tv like mr carlson from wkrp of these idiots it's like no for the most part for the most part these people are pretty smart who got there or they're sociopaths and pretty smart but i said there was one guy boy if i never have to work with him again he was just the worst and tom said oh i have one of those two i would oh he was just he's a monster i hope i never work with him again and i said what was his name and he said the name i said it was the same guy it was Ah. the exact same guy who we felt and here's uh, here's my Tom Lieberman story. Yes. It, it involves you, I think, uh, but I don't think you were on the show. Okay. So I, we were going to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, mm-hmm. to do a show for uh, somebody that makes snowmobiles. Yep. And um, I misread when my plane left. And I had gone up to St. Cloud, which for those of you that are not in Minnesota, it's about an hour and 15 minutes from home here. And uh, we had went up to see a show on a Friday night. And then I was flying to Coeur d'Alene on Saturday. And I thought my plane left at three. So I thought, well, there's no real rush to get back to. I mean, I got oodles of time. Plane left at 1115. And Ouch. it wasn't until I got home and looked that I realized, ooh, I really screwed this up. And I think I called you and said, hey, I know you're not going to be on this show, but it's a show that your company, company you work for is producing. Mm-hmm. Who is the producer? And you said, it's Tom Lieberman. And I said, can you, well, he's already out there. And I said, I don't have, can you let him know that I'm not going to be arriving on the plane he said well he's coming to pick you up and i said stop him stop him please let him know i'm not going to be there and i guess you couldn't get him and he showed up and as a gag because we know each other he had printed my name on a sign and was standing there with my name on a sign and i i ended up talking the gate agent into allowing me to take a standby flight even though it was completely my fault she was kind to a, a young actor and 
got me on the next flight. I landed, I think, at midnight. I had to rent a car and drive to Coeur d'Alene. And when I got up the next morning to go to breakfast, there's Lieberman in the breakfast nook holding that sign with my name on it. So funny you should bring him up. Again, we're on the same damn wavelength, folks. Yes. I'll yeah. have a link to some of Tom's stuff in the show notes. He's, a, he's, he's enormously tremendous. creative. Yeah. Fellow and also the nicest guy in the world. He really is. Yeah. yeah. Very, very nice guy. Speaking of nice people, next time, our next episode, we're going to listen to chapter 14 of The Myers' Dream, but we're also going to revisit uh, a bit of a conversation with a friend of the show, Kayla Drescher. Uh, oh, Kayla cool. has been on the show a couple times. Uh, the last time she was on, she talked about bar magic, and it's great stories about goofing around with customers uh, doing magic at a bar where the bartender was in on it with her and kept stealing things and giving them to her. It was a great interview, but next time, we're going to revisit conversation about pronouns which is always an interesting topic and she had some great things to say about it so we will do that next time we will listen to chapter 14 and uh, we will also have a couple new uh, i love that uh, from jim and me and we won't know what they are until we say them to each other so hey, that's, man. that's next time take care everybody bye-bye conan o'brien will not figure in the next show don't be so sure okay <laughs> This has been Behind the Page, the Eli Marks podcast with your hosts, John Gaspard and Jim Cunningham, produced by Albert's Bridge Books at Grass Lake Studios. Find this podcast and all the books in the Eli Marks series at elimarksmysteries.com. That's E-L-I-M-A-R-K-S, mysteries.com. And thanks for listening. Thank you.